despite that, there are people to um, <clears throat> academically confuse us and rationalize this all um, and create fancy terms like collateral damage. I should also add war into the list of uh, 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 this as well. Um, and there are um, people to clean up the mess. So I was in the UN, so I called the UN. Basically, their job is to clean up the mess as best as they can after uh, uh, the effect. So this whole idea of deadly hoods was um, something that we are, many of us are stuck in, or we are all in some way or other, we're using Zoom and computers and all of phones. So we're all somehow, you know, I would say hypocrites and part of this problem. Uh, ideas, what do we do now? Uh, how do we start to see ourselves in a different way? Uh, there's a lot of push now in the world for um, <clears throat> green jobs, for SDGs, um, for more and more tech-based solutions, for, for lots of things. And I think the idea of our livelihoods is, is to um, maybe offer a little bit uh, different framing of things to um, uh, hopefully uh, bring, bring a little more clarity um, uh, for those who need it and bring a little more confusion for those who need it in their lives. Um, so if you can put up the slide, as well, I'll just share a couple of um, uh, things about, about, a few things about when we say a livelihood. So the, the thing is, you know, what's the, the question simple way is what makes me come alive, my community come alive and my ecosystems come alive. There's a lot of discussion these that started to emerge all over the world about regenerative, um, regenerative, uh, economies, regenerative cultures. So I think this is very much aligned to that. Um, so we just put this, um, so many of you I think have seen this Ikigai, ikigai uh, framework, the Japanese framework. Um, and uh, one of the, one of the um, questions and that is, you know, what is, what's the work that's needed in the world uh, today? And so that is a very, you know, I thought about that a lot and that we need to elaborate more that um, what that could be or what are some of the questions we can be asking around that to, to as, as, um, as reflection points, you know, or as mirrors. Um, so I think this session is actually to raise more questions and we're, we're working on this a livelihood framework a little bit more as a way to <clears throat> invite and keep inviting more friends to add different many there's many dimensions which we haven't touched on so part of this conversation is really to explore that together with daniel inez and and all of you um what else should one of the other questions that are important to be asking as we try to make make self of make sense of ourselves and our, our role in the, in the world at these times and what's the work that's needed so I can just quickly share a few things that, that um, um, there's four, four questions which we came up, which were, one is, am I doing work that gives me joy and meaning? So uh, within that joy and meaning are actually very, obviously very deep <laughs> meaning, <laughs> very deep terms what, what those mean. But I think that's part of the, the, um, so I think one of the things in the livelihoods and all and with entire ecoversities ecosystem is that these definitions that we've been fed around what is happiness or success or meaning and all of those things or joy, we can actually reopen those boxes again and start to actually look at it. What does it mean in our context or with uh, uh, <coughs> where my community is in the world and things? So. I think the sense of purpose is something very uh, deep that, um, you know, and, and sadly, most people, if you ask them, are they very, do they find their, what they're doing in the work, giving them a deep sense of purpose or uh, meaning they most, I would say probably 99% of my friends actually would probably say no of people I grew up with and things. So um, the second, the second question is around, am I doing work that replenishes various forms of real wealth? our health, our social bonds, uh, rest, uh, rest of nature, local knowledge systems, I would say, yeah, things like that. And so we kind of differentiate between um, 
fake wealth and real wealth. And fake wealth is something that gives fills us with more scarcity. So the money system currently, I mean, people who have more and more the uh, don't seem to have a sense of, of uh, abundance, satis of satisfaction generally. And um, so if the question is, you know, um, if it's real wealth, my experience in lots of uh, uh, traditional communities is even with very little financial resources, people do have a very deep sense of abundance and connection and things. And so how do we um, start to expand our notion of wealth still after I think 50 years, the world still is too dependent on things like GNP and uh, other indicators. And even though they've been blasted, it's still become it's still the de facto uh, measurement and things. Um, and so, how do we open up ourselves to other definitions of wealth? And also, how do we, um, you know, consciously can we start to think of shifting things that are in the money system, money wealth, um, or, or let's say money economy, back into these various forms of of wealth, you know, and how do we start to facilitate that process? So we're doing several things like that in India of, um, and even the Ecoversities Alliance is like that to use some of the money to generate other forms of wealth and things again. And, and if we operate from a spirit of um, <clears throat> abundance and trust, I think what I've seen people make very different life choices versus continuous scarcity. So I think part of the, the way the toxic culture works around the world is to keep generating fear and scarcity within us. So if we get feel that we have more wealth, we might make a different set of life choices together. The third, the third um, question is, am I doing work that is changing the rules and policies to benefit communities rather than corporations? So this is fairly straightforward that we are subsidizing our demise, basically global subsidies, taxes, everything supports big corporations and, you know, hides, uh, you know, the fact that we can get a plastic bag after its entire cycle for free uh, means it's been heavily subsidized on the way or the fact that, you know, um, pesticide poisonous food is more is cheaper than uh, organically grown healthy food. Again, it's a is the idea that the subsidies that are in place and the, the way that decisions are being made are not really in um, collective spaces, but more in, behind, you know, in, in boardrooms or in, uh, in corporate boardrooms and things. And so how do we shift this idea that, you know, corporate, huge global corporations, 100 top global corporations or 500 have a huge amount of influence on the direction of the planet um, and no accountability really for what they're doing. So can we, <laughs> can we, um, can we support work that actually builds local uh, governance structures, local decision making, um, uh, and puts hands back, uh, puts power back into the uh, hands of people and communities? And the fourth uh, piece is uh, um, is is you know super interesting for me, and I think for Inez and Daniel also is this um, the worldview connection. You know, so who how do we see ourselves and uh, what does it mean to be human? You know, there's all of these narratives right now, which humans are the locusts of the planet and we're destroying everything. And I don't, you know, I, I personally don't buy into that. I think certain systems and models we've created are facilitating, but um, um, this extractivist military economy and worldview. But uh, so how do we start to shift the larger narrative um, uh, I think, and 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 reconnect us to a, a deeper sense of 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 the sacred um, is is probably the question. Um, so, in, in the work I'm doing, helping to shift this narrative and um, and moving us from again this hyper individualism based narratives or hyper survival of the fittest com com competitive narratives to something else of what we can see um, the the role and relationships of humans um, with, with the rest of, with the more than human world as well. So this is a little bit of um, framework we'd like to offer uh, to think about some of these things. We have also um, in India, at least we've identified 50 plus careers, things that people are doing right now with um, whether it's, you know, uh, um, 
supporting local farm, organic farm economies and farmers to think, rethinking our clothing, to rethinking um, how to uh, um, build healthier communities. So there's work that lots of people are doing around the world. And we've tried to identify that and tell stories around that so that young people have a, a or you know, there's also, I think young people and a lot of people who are in started their careers and are middle of their careers and really figure out they hate their jobs and they don't want to do this anymore. So, uh, what can what can inspire them? Um, so maybe we'll tell some stories about some of those people in the session too. Of, but there's a lot a lot of possibilities of how it doesn't mean if you're going for a livelihood you're going to starve to death. Uh, um, that's kind of the idea that we want to remove that fear. Um, so um, let me just uh, pause there and invite um, Inez to, to uh, share her initial reflection. So we'll listen to some to Daniel and Inez, uh, sorry, Inez and Daniel, and then uh, we will go into a breakout room for a few minutes and then uh, come back and then have a, have a longer conversation together. Is that good, guys? Yeah, okay, Inez. Great. <clears throat> Could we um, just close the screen share for a moment? Thank you. <clears throat> so hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Inez Aponte. Um, I've been doing this work for the last 15, 14, 15 years. And I kind of came to this because I um, had this big question when I first found out about climate change, um, which is 17 years ago. I couldn't work out why it was that we weren't all alarmed enough to spring into action. And at the time I had a, a one-year-old child, <clears throat> I was very, very concerned. And I kept going around the houses because a lot of people I knew also knew about climate change and they also were not really springing into action. Everything just seemed to be business as usual. And it got me on this journey of trying to understand what was actually going on. And the conclusion I came to was that if you're living in an economic system that, and the only way you can meet your needs is by destroying the planet, you will destroy the planet. So um, I have been working with communities to what I call help them activate their radical collective imaginations to think of other ways for us to meet our needs and to really to tap into what is fundamentally human, um, which I think is getting more and more eroded as we, as we go along. So the question I asked you was really, just to awaken that sense of like, well, what is it you love? What is it that you can do? And in, in a lot of ways, the things that we love and we can do meet other people's needs. So I'm going to just give you a, um, a shortish uh, presentation. Um, uh, I am much more someone who likes to be in dialogue, but I think it'd be good just to, to run you through a few concepts that I work with. And then hopefully, you know, I can hear back from you what, what you think and how this resonates. So I'm going to screen share now. Ah, brilliant. Okay, so um, I'm going to have to ask you to, forward, to, to move it forward. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, so I asked you to think about something special that you do. We've done that. Okay, can you, can you forward it again? Okay, so you might be familiar with this, um, this framework. Uh, it's a kind of version of Ikigai, which isn't really Ikigai, but a lot of people use it to find their purpose. So at the top, it's what you love doing, to the left, what you're good at, to the right, what the world needs, and at the bottom, what you can be paid for. And I would just like to go through some of those um, with you, just, just to uh, help you. So, um, yeah, if you can go to the next slide. Now, Cole, what does the world need? And we'll carry on from there. Next one. Okay, so this is the very basic, I'll go with through uh, Barefoot Economics with you. So the next slide, please. Okay, so here you'll see what uh, in Barefoot Economics are the nine fundamental needs. So this was created by a, an economist called Manfred Max Neef. Um, he had been working in some of the poorest parts of uh, the world, and he came to the conclusion that nothing he understood as an economist 
uh, could help him understand the condition of the poorest people in the world. So he came up with this framework. And these are the nine fundamental needs um, him and his colleagues um, found were universal. So all of us have these needs. What differs is, are the ways that we meet those needs. So we all need to nurture our bodies. We all have a need for subsistence. We all need to feel loved and appreciated. We need, a, we need affection. We all need to have opportunities to rest and relax. We all need to have freedom to have choice and autonomy. We all need to have understanding to make sense of the world. We all need to have opportunities to create and express ourselves. Um, we all need to feel safe and secure. We all need to have a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, and we all need to have a say and be able to join in. So um, just bear this in mind as we go through the presentation, we, I'm gonna keep coming back to those. So uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So needs are the same for all of us, but next slide. What differs are the ways we try to meet them and in barefoot economies are called satisfiers. So can we have the next slide? So here we go, here is an example of a satisfier for the need for subsistence, which is here up in the, on the left, which I've highlighted. On the left, there's someone eating a meal on her own. On the right, there is a family eating together. So um, when we talk about the economy and we talk about, oh, we all need food, what we often miss out is that there's different ways of, of eating food. There's different uh, types of food we can eat and all of those different ways of eating have an impact on that framework. So in this case, eating on your own meets your need for subsistence, you've got a meal. But on the right hand side, you can see that people are also meeting their need for participation, uh, identity, probably meeting the need for affection, maybe even the need for protection, um, maybe even idleness, a time to relax. If they've cooked the food themselves, they're meeting their need for um, understanding and the need for creation. And in human scale development and barefoot economics, we call this a synergic satisfier. Can I have a next slide, please, at all? So here I highlighted the understanding, so learning. On the left, there is someone sitting at a computer and on the right, there is a group of people outdoors. Again, there's a different quality to that satisfier. Um, yes, you can learn a lot of things from going online, but when you're with other people, when you're in a beautiful environment, when you are interacting live, you get a different type of satisfier. So in this case, you might again meet that need for participation, affection, identity, protection, you have another synergic satisfier happening. Can I have the next slide please at all? So here I highlighted freedom. We have cars, very fast cars on the left, bicycles on the right. So you might feel that you need a car to feel this sense of freedom. Um, it's likely that it also ties in with your sense of identity. The question, of course, is, is if we use cars to meet our needs for identity and for freedom, how are we impacting the rest of the world? Or even are we truly satisfying that need? Because what we're looking for in human scale development and in barefoot economics is to actually really meet a need, not to pseudo satisfy a need. Um, next slide, please. So the question really is how can we un meet our needs without harming ourselves, others, others and the earth? The earth is really at the center of us meeting our needs. We're currently living in an economic um, system that wants to pretend that we don't really need the earth to meet our needs, but of course we do. And so it's really central that we um, meet our needs in ways that are not harming others, ourselves and the earth. Next slide, please. So again, that really reframes uh, when we think about what the world needs. Have we thought enough about what an actual need is if we're going to look at our purpose through this lens? And now I wanna look at what you can be paid for. So next slide, please. So what do we value and who gets paid in this system? So I just did a Google search on bankers and there they are on the left top corner. <laughs> Apparently this is what they look like according to my search. On the left side at the bottom, uh, tech developers. On the right side, an artist. And on the right side at the bottom, we have a mother comforting her child. And I think it's obvious who gets paid are the people on the left and who are not likely to be paid for their roles 
individuals are artists on the right and parents on the right. There are a whole load of ways in which the things that we might say that we value end up being things that actually are not really valued um, financially in this system, which makes it incredibly hard to do the things that we know that we really want to be doing um, and that we know that matters. If I look through the things that people put in the, in the, in the chat when I asked you what, you what you do, what you love, those are probably a lot of things that sit on the right-hand side of this, of this um, slide. Next slide, please. So again, think about something special. You do bear that in mind and how does that fit in this framework? Next slide, please. So my conclusion is a good economy offers us ways to make a livelihoods and our livelihoods are opportunities for us to offer our gifts to meet real needs. Next slide. And our livelihoods require regenerative space. So I'll just explain what regenerative space is. Next slide. So it's a space required for humans to adequately meet their needs in harmony with other life forms while restoring the Earth's life supporting capacity. So um, that is not just actual physical space. It is also mental and emotional space. And at the moment, there is something happening to both our physical and our mental and emotional space, which is um, something that we need to be aware of. Uh, next slide, please. It's actually shrinking. So I've been working for over a decade now with communities and um, they have, I am inspired by the amount of amazing people I meet with amazing ideas. And as we try to develop them, we often come up against certain obstacles. And those obstacles are because the world is, feels like it's shrinking around us. So we have less and less opportunities to make the things we want to see happening in the world actually happen. This is to do with the dispossession, inequality, consumerism. We're being advertised to, you know, 24 hours a day. Uh, we're being distracted by um, technology. Uh, the injustices that are happening in the world make it very hard for us to actually have the space to create all the things we want to see in the world. Um, at the moment in the UK, I don't know how it is in other parts of the world. I think it's um, as bad, if not sometimes worse. Uh, it's it costs enormous amounts of money just to have a roof over your head. So if you don't have any security of where to live, it's very hard to have the inner space to actually make things happen. Next slide, please. So how do we expand our regenerative space? And I have three suggestions for that. Next slide. We have to restore. We need to get engaged in acts that halt the destruction and repair the structures and systems of our world. So that means we need to take back the land, the water, the, um, the digital spaces where we, that we need. Uh, next slide, please. We need to connect. We need to become more connected to our local places so that we can build our local economies. We can come together to work, play and celebrate. Next slide. And we need to heal. So the uh, system that we live in is very traumatizing for us, so we also need to find ways that we heal from that trauma, both the individual and collective trauma. Um, next slide. And so they fit together in this way. Uh, rather than seeing them as separate, quite often when I talk to people about activism, they think about the restore function of this triad. They think, oh, it's getting on the barricades. But actually, it's as much building the local economy and healing that is part of these three nodes and of this triad. And the way they work together is that unless we have restored the actual spaces to ourselves, we cannot grow an economy. Unless we heal enough, we are not resourced enough to be fighting the fight or to be growing the economy. Unless we have actual physical spaces, we don't have anywhere to heal. So there's a kind of dynamic between the three. Uh, next slide. And so ultimately the goal is to align our human needs with our uh, earth needs. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Inez. Wonderful. Uh, I think when you were talking about regenerative space, so I think that this is when we um, reflect a bit on what the role of ecoversities are also in the world is to help to, you know, host co-create these regenerative spaces in our lives. So that is uh, very, very important um, uh, for me. Um, so next I'll invite um, uh, 
our friend Daniel. Um, I, I told you about his past career as belly dancer, but these days he's really with the land and farming and doing really a wonderful work to uh, regenerate his own local place. So over to you, Daniel. Once a belly dancer, always a belly dancer. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so an uh, urban legend, Daniel. This is going to become an urban legend. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I actually thought we were going to have a conversation, so um, I'm, I didn't prepare a, a presentation at all. Um, but something that um, Idai said earlier, Idai earlier in the comments mentioned that there's a lot of framing that is kind of from the old to the new. And I think that's a really important point that I wanted to maybe pick up on because um, Ines asked the question, what does it mean to be fundamentally human? What does it mean to be fundamentally a participant in life as a planetary process? Um, if we really re-educate ourselves to understand who we actually are, which is expressions of life coming out of this dynamic nested complexity that we also are. So this whole notion of how we are related to each other, that we're separate individuals, separate species fighting against each other and all of that, is just one narrative that sh makes the world show up to us in a certain way. The other narrative is that life itself is a fundamentally regenerative process. And for 3.8 billion years, life has done what it does best, which is create conditions conducive to life, to, for more life to flourish. And when I say life, I also mean us. We're not separate from that life. And so how do we come back as a species to that livelihood, a livelihood of really understanding ourselves as what we have been for probably 390,000 years in this form as Homo sapiens, which is bioregional custodians of the ecosystems that brought us forth, who understood that they didn't own the land, but that they were expressions of the land. And that the only way that we could heal is by healing the larger context from which we emerge. And that's a fundamental shift about like the, the, the thing that Ines brought up with the sort of tiny little space where our purpose is. I think we need all of those dimensions somehow to integrate and overlap, um, not find that tiny little space because we literally need to re story humanity back into life. We, it, it, as long as the narrative continues to be a narrative that our current system is bad in this way, that way, and the other way, and we need to shift it to the good system that is over there, and that we're in, like even Joanna Macy and David Corton, who coined the whole, the great transition meme, are now somewhat regretting it <laughs> because the notion of transition from this to that keeps us trapped in one day we will get there. And Manish said, this session is going to be about what can I do today? And I think what we can all do today is to flip our mental switch back into appreciating that we all are regenerators. Naturally, we, the cells that are in your body, the organs that are in your body weren't the same um, six months ago. You've fundamentally regenerated most of who you think you are, including the diverse living ecosystem that is in your gut and in your mouth that isn't an individual but a walking ecosystem and we have huge powers if we also which is the other bit that our education does um, to us it draws us into one of the four ways of knowing to the point that we believe it's the only way to be in the world which is thinking so it's all about analysis and thinking mind and concepts and all of that but when we actually understand that the flip view of we are all of this, we are life living through us, um, then the notion that C.G. Jung had that, that thinking is just one of the four ways of knowing where have access to and sensing, feeling, and intuiting are the other, two, uh, other three, then sensing, feeling, and intuiting is actually what we need 
to meet uncertainty in this nested complexity we live in. We need to respond to a world that we will never know perfectly. There is no education that will give us a perfect knowledge of the world. It'll give us one slice and there are many. So what we even science tells us that complex dynamic systems are fundamental, unpredictable and uncontrollable. So how do we shift to appropriate participation rather than prediction and control? Through dancing with the system, through sensing, feeling and intuiting the system and being informed by the mind. No both and here, no from this to that, but a true integration. And the last thing I want to do, because Manish asked me to um, just quickly share one slide, this one. Um, a lot of people are stuck in this narrative at the moment, partially with, um, fueled by the very good work of the wonderful people in the, the U lab, Otto Scheimer and so on, that we're at this big shift from ego to equal. And I think the, the wonderful questions that Manish had in his opening slide can be simplified to the three questions that I found regenerative cultures, indigenous regenerative cultures all over the world have a form of this triethic questioning about purpose and meaning and wise action, appropriate participation, which is with anything you do, ask the question, does it serve yourself? Does it serve your community? And does it serve life? And that makes the ego eco dualism from one to the other, a pendulum swing that if we go from ego to eco, then we'll swing back to ego. It's understanding that what regeneration is about at, at the very heart is that we cannot express our own uniqueness, our own gift to the world, what the Sufis say is written on the back of our heart, unless we do so in service to the nested wholeness that brought us forth, our community, our family, our ecosystem, our bioregion, the planet. And that's what this graphic tries to express. They, they, they express the images, um, like the, the three icons are from Ishia Black, and I just rearranged them in a different way. But I just find it really useful to, to put Seva, this, this wonderful Vedantic notion of being in service to life and understanding that if we want to serve ourselves, if we serve community in the world, we will serve ourselves well and we will move from a lively, from deadlyhoods to um, a livelihoods. And, and but the, uh, the other dimension of this is, of course, technology going from killing things, technology that kills us, to living re, which Buckminster Fuller um, suggested by now 40 years ago, but that's a whole nother conversation. So um, I'll leave it at that because we've only got another 25 minutes to hear some voices. Yes, thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you. Um, I think we um, so we have 25 minutes. We can, um, what we had planned was to give about um, eight minutes in breakout rooms so we could hear about, um, get, at least meet each other and take a little bit of a few minutes to reflect on what you've heard and come back with some of your questions and observations and things like that, or inputs you would like to share into the dialogue, or we can go straight into the dialogue. Uh, what do you feel, Daniel and Ines? What would you like to do? And what do you think is better right now? I'm just... Oh. <laughs> God, I hadn't thought about that. Um, Daniel, please. I just would love to hear who else is in the room, but they've, they've been listening to us very patiently. Okay, so let's, yeah. let's do this then. Let's take um, one minute or let's take two minutes of silence so people can digest all of this. And uh, and then we will we will uh, ask everyone's, I'll ask everyone's apology that we're not going into breakout rooms. And then we can kind of, uh, start listening to what people's um, reflections or takes are. Is that okay for everyone? If there's any big objection, please let me know and I'll make your own personal breakout room for you if you want it. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll just, because of the time, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. So, okay, let's take a minute of, uh, two minutes of silence. I'll just invite everyone to close their eyes, feel their feet on the ground. Um, Take a few deep breaths. We shared a lot, so think, be with it. Uh, but and, and observe what's coming up for you. Uh, 
Okay, so I'll invite you back, everyone. Um, so one thing I, I feel that is very important um, in all of this work, and I keep reminding myself and all of dear friends, is a bit of playfulness. Um, and uh, that very much for me is a, a source of a livelihood also, is when we bring playfulness and things. So I'll just invite you all to come back in with a giant laugh together. Together. If we can laugh all at once, a crazy, wild laugh as loud as you can. Let's all give one laugh. Ha 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 with for today and yet I don't really know or we don't really know and it's also okay and we can still be together and keep uh, keep uh, living this beautiful life that we've all been given so thank you um, so I'll open the floor please um, we have limited time we'd like to hear from as many people as possible maybe we'll take 10 minutes or so and um, if any any short reflection or any um, question you want to put in and then we'll have the last 10 minutes maybe uh daniel and as and i can share some few closing comments then is that good okay so please yeah try to limit yourself or to one uh, one minute or one and a half minute if when you're speaking so we can hear um as many people as possible can you uh, so hi hi had his hand up first okay. do you want to ask the question sure. thank you thanks <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Ines. Uh, I, I, and thank you for allowing me to take that reflection, the two-minute reflection, because my, I was so excited, and I hear so many such a you know beautiful ideas, and and in that reflection, I went to just the simplest of it, which is all three. You speak about this trinity, uh, you know, which is a. Uh, Going past this, the duality, this polarized duality, and this is and it, and it, and it's, it is the Trinity where I feel in a lot of my life is uh, focusing on this balance between you know yin and yang and black and white, and and when I realize the balance is is in a, a third component, this you know in in Bali we say yin ang for 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 yin and yang. But then once you transcend it, you go into an ohm space. And, and, and in that ohm space is where I see Ines and her healing. Or in the ohm space is where I see um, Daniel uh, 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 Serva uh, being in service. So I think, you know, I think they're all, that all three is necessary. And some people will, will come from the ego. Like my brother, he comes from the ego and he may some money and he lives that lifestyle and he, and, he, and you know you uh and and he's and he can serve he can help us in in that service uh uh in that offering he can uh help the 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 server and uh and uh the 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 eco and so that's that's my input i i really thank you for giving us these framework and this this trinity of understanding so now we know where we can come from and and be able to collaborate together more seamlessly thank you thank you hi i think it was uh it was a catherine next hi um i can't i can't get my video up sorry um, okay but i just wanted to say that when i was reflecting and i was reflecting daniel on what you said um on, I, I think that is the crux of the whole thing to understand who we are as humans um, and not even who we become, but to go back to who we are. And, uh, and I just think we need to do that in the earliest ages in schools. And all of us have some connection to schools. We have connections to either teachers or we're parents or we're something. And, and I think if we can start with the youngest children to begin to understand that who we are in connection to the biosphere. Um, I think for me, that's that's the crux of everything. It makes me excited to think that we can change this narrative. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, for for Brice, 
Fabrice, yes, were you, yeah. Fabrice, Fabrice. No, I was struck by, by this idea that we might be working towards uh, preparing the ground for a post-binary uh, perspective because you know, modernity is not is not going to give up so easily, right? And and we're living in the cracks of of this uh, double dimension, and and it's so easy as our friend was saying to be in a binary state. So the thing that struck me the most was about regenerative spaces, because otherwise we end up working twice as hard, <laughs> you know, trying to be. Uh, you know, uh, doing something different, thinking that it's going to be quick. So th the main, the question I wanted to bring up was about the emphasis we have sometime about the the body, you know, and, and somatic work and being rooted and everything. And we need to reconsider the importance of cultivating an imaginal and relational body as a seed for this post-binary dimension of relationality and deep uh, Seva, and you know, I really like that that idea. But how do we do it? How do we bring it down to practices? And of of course, asking how is already wrong because <laughs> there's no set answer, right? How do we do it? No, that's not the right. That's not the right question. But but the imaginal, you know, like the body is not just physical. It's more than that. And maybe tapping a bit more into that would help regenerative, uh, you know ongoingness and shape shifting. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrice. I think it was Porva next. Um, hi, I'm on the way back uh, from a beautiful trip with my daughter in India. We went to the beach. Uh, so I'm not looking at the screen directly to look ahead. Uh, I think it uh, was very powerful for me. Can you hear me? Is it clear? Yes. Beautiful. Okay. It was very powerful for me to think or listen to. Uh, it simplified it for me to think everything that I do, what need is it serving? Is it serving my need? Is it serving the community's need? And is it s serving the need for, you know, for life? So these three questions... Um, I think I just, they've already started happening, but thank you for simplifying it uh, because I would, I would think about it in every action that I do. Like right now I was, I was doing it because it's me and my daughter in the car. And I was thinking, hmm, we went for a trip. Did we just serve our need? Uh, did we do anything for the community in that? <laughs> You know, did I serve anything for life in that? Uh, so yeah, it's it's. Um, thank you, just thank you for that. It was very powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Pova. Uh, I think uh, Karina. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I am. I am thrilled. Like in thinking in this way, we are. We, it's like I feel like regenerating the ways we are serving our or satisfying our needs, first of all. And with that intersection that you mentioned, Ines, uh, and I feel like if we are uh, satisfying correctly <laughs> or the, harmoni uh, the most harmonic way we can our needs, uh, and with this you know, integral part that you say, for example, when, when you're taking dinner and you're also satisfying the need of participation, belonging, creation, and, and as everything that is inside is also what we reflect and we create outside, we can be working in this, on all the dimensions. So, I don't know, I am just chewing that in my own life like how can I daily things that I do, the tiny things that I do can be uh, great things, you know, because it are more integrative. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Karina. Um, Denise. 
Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for offering so generously your work and the, the ideas that have shaped it. Um, I have two uh, questions or, let's say, invitations to think uh, with. Um, the first one, these questions of, is it serving me? Is it serving my community? Is it serving life on uh, the planet? Um, I often find myself asking these questions, but then I also uh, find myself negotiating with the time release, meaning that um, we're asking these questions uh, and making decisions based on what we think is the Im immediate result that is beneficial. Um, so I'm just introducing here the time release aspect of thinking about what I think is serving me today or tomorrow or my community might not uh, the day after. And, you know, a, a, an example is thinking seven generations ahead, which uh, indigenous people have learned and embodied to, to do. And um, I think while we learn to, to incorporate these three pivotal questions into our way of life, uh, time is also important. And the second thing um, about this um, binary of, of between uh, livelihoods and deadlyhoods is that uh, I feel like one of the things we need also to learn to do, maybe at least that I need to, would like to learn how to do, is to um, stay with the death of a world that we are living in and learning to uh, let it lay to rest. Um, to make space for regenerative uh, learning, regenerative spaces, because it's, um, mm, mm, I think mourning is important. It's, a, it's, an, an, it's an important phase uh, before you re regenerate. Um, so I think that looking away from the um, decay, uh, looking away from the death, um, is also a diversion that is can be detrimental to the longevity of what we're trying to regenerate. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Um, uh, Olga? Okay. Hello. I uh, really was touched by um, several points made uh, today, and one of them is uh, healing. I think that um, it's connected to another point that touched me, that being human. I think that um, uh, I agree with Fabrice that the how is less important than to get connected to your humanity and this intention to, to heal. And then the hows will kind of show up, uh, the, the most relevant uh, hows will uh, reveal themselves. So. For me, um, in the tough situations when I'm most confused and challenged and scared, uh, I go back to feeling my dignity as a human being and set intention that um, that are my values and this is what um, I would like to bring out and uh, you know stand with and also help others you know, support them to, to give myself and the others courage to stay human in their, you know, craziest situations that life uh, is full of, right? So for me, um, healing trauma is connected to, you know, healing something bigger in our communities and the earth. So um, I usually remind myself to start with myself and but then i want to see um kind of outwards when uh, i have enough self-empathy how to offer it um, forward and um, i really enjoy this um, concepts these points and um, I, I feel that uh, everything that i heard tonight really is woven together very nicely in, in these concepts of um, being human and um, helping the healing. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you, Olga. Uh, Manish, do you want to? Yes, so I'll invite maybe um, 
Daniel, do you want to respond? Um, Whatever yeah, the well, for you. There was a lot of really rich. Inez, Inez and Daniel, we have about seven minutes. So Okay, I'll, I'll keep it short to um, to not take time off from Inez. Uh, the, the two things that I want to kind of highlight from what I heard um, is like to also to respond to your, your request early at the start of this um, to, to be specific about what we can do differently right now. And I think it's that invitation that we stop talking about something we need to do in the future and we start anchoring ourselves back into life because we are life. And the way to do that is by not talking in the abstract, but being rooted in place. So whatever, like there's so much talk now about regeneration and Manish and I shared a webinar with Carol Sanford uh, last week. And she said, if, if, if you're talking in the abstract, if you're talking about general plans, blueprints, um, how to create a sustainable society or regenerative community, you're not doing regeneration. The only way that we can reconnect with our own ability to regenerate ourselves, our community and life is if we do so in a place sourced and community sourced way. It is by not looking at the complexity of global problems and solutioneering our way into a better world. It's about embracing the complexity that we meet head on when we see people with real names in real contexts and real communities with a real ecosystem in a real narrative. And we embrace that and we don't say, oh, we're also imperfect and now we have to start building a regenerative culture. No, we foreground in these real community that regeneration is already going on. And then the other thing I just wanted to highlight is, is um, Denise said two really important things about the whole approach of working on solutions only gets us into the pattern that we've had as humanity for a long time that yesterday's solutions become today's problems. So how could our also regenerative solutions be forever? Yes, I can only say. But what can be forever is the practice as a community in place to live the questions together. I shared a couple of posts on that. For me, we have it wrong by looking for answers in education. The best thing education can ever do is to enable people to have a community place source process of inquiry into what it means to be humans and how we can serve self, community, and world. And um, in that context, last a bit, we do have to embrace death and collapse as part of regeneration. We have left it so long. We've known about climate change for 50 years and have done jack shit. And we've we started talking about it a little bit more, but we haven't really, we've we made it worse ever since. And in that sense, we are now committed by a small proportion of humanity, all of humanity is now committed to living through very tumultuous decades. And that means we need to heal our relationship to collapse and letting go and death. We will see a lot of structures that we're currently still needing to feel safe and comfortable fall away in the next three decades. And in community, in a place-focused way, doing what we can in a particular place, we might be able to weather those storms and we might actually rediscover ourselves as regenerative beings. And it, the change is not a change in doing, the change is a change in being first and foremost, and then everything else flips. Um, that's me. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so, um, yes, I agree with everything you say. Just quickly, I noticed someone said in the in while pe people were talking, oh, I'm fed up with these conversations. What can I actually do? What jobs can I do? And I think I just want to bring the perspective of having, I am uh, the child of immigrants from the colonies. Um, a lot of people are not in this space of understanding what's going on. And I think uh, as those of us who understand what needs to happen, we need to reach out to those people who are really struggling. This is why I talk about regenerative space. You cannot tell a mum with four children on a low income in a, in a flat, oh, think about the environment. No, 
you need to make sure that people are okay before people can join your your project and we miss that every time we are missing the the opportunity to go into what's happening to people around austerity because when people understand that what's happening to the earth is happening to people they can align but if you if we start allowing the narrative on the right to be oh it's uh, you know watch those green people they want to take your freedoms away unless we get in there and we start to direct that conversation we just are at risk of of people becoming radical and it's incredibly dangerous times right now so i'd encourage you to think about how those systems are keeping people in place and particularly the poorest um and not just the poorest in the poor parts of the world in the uk we have an incredible um uh um inequality happening right now and the other thing to say about that is that uh if you're thinking about okay what job can i do at the moment unless we change the system of money and how we reward people for what they do if you even if you get end up with a job that wins the system doesn't allow everyone to win and that's where the human skill development framework when we start to look at where is the value then we have to look at where is all the unpaid labor happening most of the work in the world happens it's it's women and 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 young girls that are doing most of the labor in the world unpaid and these are the kind of political issues that really we need to grapple with so you know that all of us the artists the mothers the fathers the musicians we should all be able to live in the world and be able to express those beautiful things you just shared with me this is what gets me to be alive this is what i can offer in the world we need to fight for that it's not going to get given to us and there is a very strong political movement that we need to do as well as building and as well as healing but i think we mustn't ignore that there is a uh, you know a big struggle um for us ahead um and if we can get the poorest of the poor on board then we are the 99% in a true sense and uh, thank you very much everyone for your attention 15 just in time <laughs> um yeah i would uh, just uh, I, i wanted to share a few things but i don't know if we have time so it's okay i'll let it go but i just think that uh, the invitation is um around um hopefully unlearning and some of the concepts that we've held we, that that i would say modernity has held as sacred cows whether it's scale or mobility or even individualism or many of the things that we've tried you know this modern culture has been built on um i think there's um an invitation to maybe we uh look at it things at a different way for example like for us one of the operating systems is to start looking at how do we form new forms of joint family rather than this individual nuclear family as a model it's almost impossible for a family even with both parents working full time to make ends meet and things like that and so how can we start to reorganize ourselves our daily living patterns um uh and and invite maybe and that means and you know my, the, in india i see even this with urban people like our sense of personal space and everything and ownership and all of these things come into question but i think these are the the everyday live things that we can start to explore differently in terms of uh if we think we're going to continue with the same mindsets um and just build some regenerative culture i don't think it's going to happen there's there's some fundamental shifts in the way we just even organized our daily lives that we can start to think about and so i just offer that as a as a um uh reflection and we're trying to do a bunch of that in in udaipur where i live and we'd invite people over to come and experience it with us thank you so much uh, um oh let me just share this too so this thread this is a good way to close our So this thread we have a we have a festival every year called Raksha Bandhan Rocky for short and this is a sacred thread of life and care and compassion and you can tie this thread there's a saying in India Vasudev Kutumbakam the whole world is our family and so it's very interesting this thread this thread you can tie it on anyone and it's not like that it can be any any hum, other human or it can be your tree or it can be your uh animals um or it can be even your your you know your um your books or whatever and and this thread means that we are we are recognizing the the mutual care and, and connection between us and you can declare that that being as your brother or sister 
uh, or or honor the sacred relationship with you. With him. so this is an invitation that you know we're not alone. I think this is the most fundamental thing. I think that this toxic culture wants to keep telling us is that we're alone in this. And if we start, you know, I would invite you to get some threads and start tying them, and start to expand your sense of of family, uh, extended family. And then it gives us, at least for me, it's given me a lot of energy to start to um, look at things and engage with things very differently. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Big thanks to Daniel and Inez for for being on this. I want to continue, guys. So we should we should plan something else uh, together. Uh, oh, I love that heart. My God, the belly dancer gave me a heart. My heart is beating fast now. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, and um, we invite you also um, to to keep being in this dialogue with us in Ecoversities. It's really uh, it's they are really deep. Uh, Conversations and conversations that are in the everyday doing, as Daniel said, place-based and body using our bodies and our relationships, engaging with those very deeply. I think that's how we we all, I would speak on behalf of Inez and Daniel here, that we all see that as being very essential to building a new paradigm. So thank you all. Take care. Wherever you are, be, be thank safe. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love you all. Thank you. Bye.